Amen. Uh, it'll be exciting to be in Orlando. I think I saw my old house on there. If I don't come back, you know why. Uh, I love Orlando, and I don't like negative six-degree weather. Today, we got to hop right in. I want you to turn in your Bibles over to Psalm. Actually, yeah, we'll start in Psalm uh, chapter 34, where we were last week. I don't want to neglect uh, just... The, I know we were going to pray for uh, the Benz, for Richard, and for uh, yeah, uh, Richard and Lorraine's mom, but also for Gordon. Gordon lost his brother earlier this week. Uh, they had the funeral, so we want to be praying for Gordon uh, Jones as well. And so, uh, so we want to keep them in our prayers. Also, we have a, a, a refugee that's in town uh, that had gone, that had, was here in the nice, cozy confines of Connecticut and Hartford and moved down to Texas. Juliana Gabriel, where's Juliana? <laughs> Amen, may the Lord grant you with ice and snow. Okay, <laughs> what we're doing is we're talking about the fear of the Lord. Our whole entire series this year is about loving God with all of your soul, all of our souls uh, from the inside out. And uh, part of that, what we're doing, we're going through the Psalms of the year. Uh, we are going to be in this particular portion of the year talking about the whole soul and learning how to get our whole, our, our souls whole so that we can worship God. And the challenge is for a lot of us, we don't focus in enough on our souls uh, and so we can't love God with all of our souls if they're not whole, right? And uh, as Scott shared, and I appreciate so much him sharing, uh, just about we've got to grow and mature. Uh, there are areas in my life my wife will tell you I, I refuse to mature in, and I pray. <laughs> and I'm, I'm praying that God doesn't make me mature in those areas. Uh, he'll bring me his grace. In any case, the... But this portion, as we're talking about the whole soul, we're going to talk, we've been talking about fearing the Lord. And today we're talking about the discipline of the fear of the Lord. And in Psalm chapter 34, uh, in verse 9, we read last week, it says the fear of the Lord, in verse 11, in verse 9 of chapter 34 of Psalm. It says the fear of the Lord, fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry. But those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And we talked a little bit about that last week, about how the fear of the Lord is something that all of us need to have. It's in, in Psalm chapter 111, we'll read in just a second. Uh, it says the fear of the Lord, uh, the fear of the Lord Actually, here in Psalm 111, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. And the fear of the Lord is something we all need to grow and mature in. I was reading, I was, I was watching a video, and this uh, one minister was talking about a, a famous minister here in the United States in the 70s and 80s. And this guy grew to, to worldwide prominence. He's a prosperity preacher, false doctrine, all the whole bit. Uh, but he was uh, famous. I mean, they literally built amusement parks. Uh, he got in trouble uh, because he had an affair uh, with a woman in the 90s. He got exposed in the 90s in any case. Uh, and then he, also, he got put in, jail for, uh, put in jail for fraud. And another minister went to go visit him in jail and asked him, so, so when did you stop loving Jesus? When did you stop loving Jesus? And the guy said, I never stopped loving Jesus, which, anyway, that's doubtful. But he said, I never stopped loving Jesus. He goes, what I did do is I stopped fearing the Lord. He said, I stopped fearing the Lord. He goes, I always loved you, but I didn't fear the Lord. And for a lot of us, that whole concept of fearing the Lord, we, we are kind of repelled by that because we love Jesus and we want the grace and we want that feel-good stuff, Right? And the reality is that's there. But the Bible says in Hebrews that God and Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And God doesn't change. The God in the Old Testament that struck down 24,000 Israelites, his chosen people, because of their immorality, he struck them down. That doesn't change today. That God is just as displeased. That God will discipline us. That we need to have a reverence. And we want to treat him with the reverence he deserves. 
uh, there's a, a brother I really love. And as he prays, he starts every prayer. He says, uh, dear Heavenly Father, dear Dad, Pops. And he says Pops. He calls him Pops in the prayer. I used to call my dad Pops, so it's kind of funny. But I, I talked to him one day. I said, bro, I said, I know you. the Abba Father thing is real cool. I said, but make sure you just don't lose your reverence for God. I said, though he is Abba Father and Daddy and Pops and all that, he is also Lord God Almighty. And he plays no games. Amen, Siobhan? Okay. <laughs> I want us to turn over in Isaiah chapter 11. Why am I dressed like this? We're going to talk about the discipline of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11. The discipline of the fear of the Lord. Discipline is, there are several ways, as you, Isaac shared about the discipline, he got every syllable, right? Uh, and God does do that to us at times. There are times when he will oppose the proud, he will let us experience the full consequences for our sin. But the other part of discipline is a training so that we grow from a weakness in a particular area to a strength. And the reason I'm dressed like this, or an excuse for a reason I'm dressed like this, uh, is, you know, you got to dress right for training, right? you got to get your mindset right for training. This is generally what I work out in, or what I wear when I'm not at church, <laughs> except for this one, in the wintertime. And we're going to learn that we're going to learn some of the things and ways that we need to get disciplined in the fear of the Lord, how we need to train ourselves in the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, speaking about Jesus, the Bible says, a shoot will come up from the, from the root, from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And here I'm talking about Jesus and how Jesus, when he was coming, he would delight in the fear of the Lord and that he would, the fear of the Lord would rest on him. And I know it's awkward in thinking about coming before God when it says in 1 John, perfect love drives out fear. But the Bible also says that, man, we need to fear the Lord. So how do you do that? How do you come before God and feel like I'm a father, but also, you know, daddy, but also feel like, amen, there's total reverence. Because God wants us to come near. And I think the, the more we learn about him and his character and the more discipline we have in understanding and the more discipline we have in our fear of the Lord and understanding and making it a strength, the more respect, the more we honor him, the more God makes it clear. And we're going to look at someone who really did this well. And there's four particular aspects of this we're going to talk about. In Genesis chapter 22, we're going to look at Abraham. In Abraham's training in the fear of the Lord. And there's four particular areas we're going to look at. If we're going to be trained in the fear of the Lord, we need to obey immediately. Obey with an L. Obey in the dark and obey to completion. I'll explain each of these as we go. In Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm going to ask Brett, can you hand me my bag? Because I've got my glasses in there and I'm struggling with all the Lord's energy to read. Genesis chapter 22. I will be 50 this year. And I have asked the Lord for an early birthday gift. Today, even, I've asked that he deliver today. <laughs> and just if you're wondering, I know there are people out there spreading this false doctrine uh, about Daniel chapter 8 and verse 7, about how, you know, the, the, the goat will trample over uh, the ram and all that kind of stuff. That's false doctrine. Because in the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus separates the sheep and the goats. And, you know, sheep are part of the ram family, and goats are just goats. Uh, they are to be curried. And so uh, God... So we know what happens to the goats in Matthew 25. Amen? <laughs> Amen. 
back to Jesus. Four areas of discipline. Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at Abraham's training. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Uh, when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb uh, for the burnt offering, my son. Sounds a little bit like Isaac and his mom, right? It's interesting. It's, verse 9, it says, when they, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid, on him, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there in the thicket and he saw a ram caught by its horns. Uh-oh. He's... <laughs> should have picked another text. <laughs> Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it <laughs> instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day he has said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Let's pray. <laughs> Okay, for some, for, for some context, Abraham, uh, Abraham was favored by God in Genesis chapter 12. He was called, he obeyed God. Uh, in chapter 15, he, God called him and said, I want you to go to this, plant, this land that you don't know, make it your own. He went in faith and left everything he knew. He went to this land, uh, the promised land. Later we would find out the land of Canaan. Uh, in chapter 15, God and Abraham had a conversation and Abraham said, hey, look, I appreciate all this, you know, it's great, I'm well taken care of, but I don't have an heir. I don't have a son. And at this time, children were the biggest reward. He's like, I don't have a son. I don't have an heir to carry on my name. And God made him a promise that I will make your descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore. He said, and I'll do this in your old age. And so he gave him a son, Isaac, in his old age. And then God said, I want you to sacrifice that son. And God, interestingly enough, several times said, I want you to take your son to the place I'll tell you about. I want you to go. I want you to sacrifice that son, your only son. God continued to reemphasize, your only son. And Abraham, it says, after he got the command, it says, early the next morning, he set out. Part of the discipline and the fear of the Lord is we've got to obey immediately. We've got to obey immediately. In the New Testament, I was studying with a friend uh, this week. We were in studying the Bible together, and we were reading about Ananias, and we were reading about the Apostle Paul and his conversion. He was Saul at the time. His conversion, and Ananias, God calls Ananias and says, I want you to go. There's a man waiting for you, uh, and he's waiting for you to tell him what he's supposed to do, you know, basically baptize him. And Ananias said, wait, you don't know who this man is. He's done great harm to your church, and the Lord just said, go. And it says, the next day he got up and went. Uh, Peter, when told to go to Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts, 
Uh, he had a vision, didn't understand it. And then uh, these men came from Cornelius, uh, who was later to hear about Jesus become a Christian. It says that Peter just went. He went in the home of Gentiles where he wasn't even supposed to be, but he went immediately because of what God told him to do. And I think the challenge for most of us when it comes to fear of the Lord, but we, we don't, uh, we have this perception that when God says something, that we actually have the luxury of, oh, well, let me, let me think about that. Let me, let me see if, if I really agree with that. Let me, let me, let me make sure it's kind of on my timeline because I've got some things going on. And the Lord says, no, like when it's time to go, you got to go. Abraham went immediately. And the amazing thing about that is I don't know what he dreamt about. I don't know what he was feeling. I just know that it's early in the morning. He got up, got the crew together and said, let's go. And it says that on the way, there was three, there was a three-day period that he was on, he, that he had to deal with, and we'll get to that in a second. But God didn't tell him anything else. He said, go, I want you to sacrifice your son, and he went immediately. The challenge for most of us when it comes to fear of the Lord, and we can figure out how strong or how weak we are in this area, is how quickly we obey. Is how quickly we obey. How quickly we get on our knees and say, God, this is hard, but let's go. Yeah. I'm willing to do this. So encouraging as you read, and for those of you studying the Bible, uh, when you read in the New Testament, how long it takes people to actually come to Jesus and, and repent and get baptized. It says it literally takes all the per everybody in the Bible, except for one person, it takes one day. One day. They read the Bible and say, whoa, I'm, I'm in, living in the dark. I'm not doing what the Bible says. I need to repent. Why shouldn't I get baptized? And they get baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. But for a lot of us, we're like, yeah, I got to think about it. Uh, let me see if it works with my schedule. I got to consider my school schedule. Oh, work. That's going to be challenging. How's that going to work out? No, repent. Today. You may not know everything and how it's all going to pan out, but you see in God's word and you see the command. Here's what I need to do. For some of us, when God says, man, go and make disciples, go share your faith. And for those of us that have already been baptized, we feel a prompting in our spirit. Like, man, you should share your faith with that person. Invite them to church. And you know what we do? Uh, I don't know if it's the right time. I don't know if it's the right context. We do this with our family members, our neighbors, our classmates, our, our co-workers. And then guess what? It's never the right time. Whenever the spirit says go, we need to go. And the problem is when we don't fear the Lord. And if we don't respond immediately, there's an area of our faith. There's an area of the fear of the Lord we're weak in. The amazing thing about Abraham was he responded immediately and he went immediately. How many questions did Abraham ask? How many clarifying questions did he ask? So, so wait a minute. So you want me to go sacrifice? What, with what do I need to go and sacrifice it with? Uh, what kind of wood do I need to put on the on the altar? Uh, should I take anybody with me? Or no, he just went. And for a lot of us, we have a lot of ways that we make excuses so that we don't obey God. It's because we don't fear Him. The fear of the Lord, one of the disciplines, we've got to obey immediately. Next, we've got to obey with an L. I will translate. You guys know what an L is? Taking an L. Uh, a loss, right? Siobhan knows what that is. Uh, taking an L. Enough, let me translate it for those of you not in popular culture. Uh, it's obeying God even when there's no benefit to you. There was no perceivable benefit for Abraham sacrificing Isaac, but yet he went. And for a lot of us, and I know me, I am a cost-benefit analysis master. And I can do it quickly. If my wife asks me to do something around the house, I'm like, I'll get that done. Because that might result in something good for Timmy a little bit later. Right? <laughs> that might be good for me. It might be, man, if I, if I let her go do this, then I'll be freed up to do this later. If I take the kids here, then I may be able to do this later. If I wash the dishes, maybe Timmy will get one of those, you know, Jen and uh, Ben Beelan kisses later. Amen. <laughs> I'm always doing cost-benefit analysis, and so are you. Yeah. 
And we do that with the Lord. We're doing a cost benefit analysis all the time. Figuring, okay, what is the benefit? Okay, if I give this much, maybe God will do this or whatever. No, Abraham didn't do that. He went with no perceivable benefit. His one and only heir, he was willing to give him up for God. And for a lot of us, we're not willing, we're not willing to obey when there's a loss involved. And so in high school, we don't share our faith on campus because we don't want to get ostracized. Kind of the currency in high school, the currency in junior high is popularity, is not being ostracized, not being mocked. And so we, you know, we don't, we don't do it as much. In college, it gets a little bit more intensified. And so, man, we don't want to be that Jesus freak. We don't, and so we, we operate thinking about, oh, there's really no benefit, so I can't do it. We do it in marriage and our dating relationships. We do it at work and all this stuff. We're like, man, there's no benefit for me. And as Americans in living in the U.S., everything we do, everything we're built to do has to have a benefit for us. All advertising is about there's something that if you buy this, if you own this, if you wear this, there's a benefit for you. It's in our DNA. And so when it comes to God, we've got to fear the Lord because even we've got to fear the Lord, even if it means a loss for us. Abraham, he obeyed even when there was no perceivable benefit. God didn't say at this point, you know, if you do this, something really good is going to come on the other side. I've got plans to prosper you, not to harm you, give you hope in the future. I'll give you a hundred times as much. He didn't say all that. He said, go sacrifice your son. With no hint of a promise on the other side. And Abraham obeyed. You know, for, for a lot of us, we look at Christianity and we don't see, we don't see the benefit. And we don't see it right away and so we hold off. And so we kind of keep Jesus at a distance. We're around, but we're not really all in. And if we're not all in, the way that God looks at it is like, look, I'm all in. I gave my son. I've operated at a loss with no, no guarantee that you would respond. I gave the life of my son. And so what do you think he expects from us? You think he would take any less? You think Mimo, as he was up there uh, about to get married to Siobhan, if he was like, look, I can only give you three weeks a month. You think she would sacrifice everything for him? No. She wants it all. Right, Mimo? <laughs> We've got to operate like Abraham did at a loss. Next, you've got to obey in the dark. Obey in the dark. It says that Abraham, for these three days, as he traveled all the way, God didn't tell him what the plan was. Abraham was humble. He didn't ask a bunch of questions. He went, and he may have had to do a lot on the way. He may have had to do a lot of soul searching. Imagine going with the one son you have been promised. We're looking, my wife and I were looking at uh, videos of our, our first son, and it took us about, uh, it felt like forever. It took us about four years to get pregnant. There was nothing wrong. It just God's timing. And so when we finally got pregnant, uh, you know, I was in, you know, technology at the time, I was videotaping everything. And so we got videos of Tyler and then we're showing Tyler uh, himself crawling and all this stuff. And, you know, it was so, it was just awesome. Your first kid, it took so long. You never didn't even know if you're going to be able to have your own children. Uh, and I know some of us have battled with that. You know, but having your own child, and and I'm imagining Abraham during those three days reliving all the things that he went through, waiting for his first child, and then traveling and reliving all the memories, first steps, and all these different types of things. I don't know what they did at that time, but just remembering, you know, him learning how to talk and communicate, his first smiles and laughs, and all those things, and not having an answer of why God told him to go sacrifice your son. And for a lot of us, God asks us to do things, and it's just not our business. It's not our business to know all the details laid out. Here, God, here, you know, okay, I want you to obey this. Here's the flow chart. When we're starting the North Region here in the heart, 
in 2011. I was really excited. I knew our church we were too big for our building. We needed to split. And so in 2010, uh, I started traveling around uh, the kind of the north part of the city and looking for places to meet. And then the next year, kind of the elders and the, and the staff put together a plan. We're going to start a new region. And then the place, one of the places I looked at opened up. Uh, Juliana, as a matter of fact, was one of the people that, that said, hey, why don't you call this place? And I called that place. It opened up. We started meeting at, at a church up in the north. Everything opened up. But before then, I was like, I'm really excited to start this north region. Jimmy, who was here with it, I was like, Jimmy, why don't you go? I live here in Newington, and I'm, I'm close to the church. Here in West Hartford, you're already kind of on the north side. Why don't you go? You're more mature. You're more experienced. I'll stay right here with the gym right behind my house. Uh, and Stu Leonard's, they just built the Sam's Club. I'm all set. Anyway. And Jimmy was like, no, you go. And I did not want to go. I was not fired up to go at all. I didn't want to move because I hate moving. Uh, and... So we moved, we started looking for a place and we got a place that I was not fired up about. Uh, but who knew what God was gonna do in the North region? Uh, God built and built and God blessed us in so many different ways. Uh, and I know for me, I experienced the joy because man, I did not wanna go. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know most of the people because I've been working with campus and singles and majority of the people that were going were married. And so I was, you know, I was like, hey amen, I'll go, but I, and God really blessed it. And I think what we've got to understand is on the other side, every time, short term or long term, there are blessings when we obey in the dark. Amen. And we've got to get we've got to get humble. And for a lot of us, we're just not humble. And I don't get it. I don't get everything God does. And I honestly, I don't think I would understand everything God does. I don't understand why God would have. Uh, you know, God would allow Hitler as a ruler in our time. I don't understand why he would allow so many people to get killed. I don't know. I know part of his grand scheme is for as many people as possible to be saved. I couldn't tell you in our current situation. I, don't, I couldn't tell you why our political system is the way it is. All I know is that God is working in every way to help as many people as possible to know him. I don't need to know all the details. And for some of us, man, we refuse to we refuse to obey and we don't fear God. And so we're like, God, until you make everything absolutely clear, I will not obey. God's like, okay, don't obey. See how that works out for you. And for a lot of us, we've experienced the consequences for not obeying in the dark. It's, God's not obligated to tell us anything. He's God. We're not. Isaiah, it says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. It's like, my ways are so much higher. If we got what we wanted and did what we wanted, you know how jacked up the world would be? You realize if the church was the way we wanted it to be? Man, if salvation worked the way we wanted it to work, we'd be messed up. We would look just like the world looks. That's why Jesus said, look, if you want to be great, you got to be a servant. All right. on, and bro. yeah, all the leadership principles, you know all that. But if you're not serving anybody, you're not leading anybody. Right. You're just a talker. We've got to learn how to obey in the dark. God knows better. And lastly, we've got to obey to completion. Amen. We've got to obey to completion. Abraham took Isaac all the way up. He didn't just start out. He didn't just go through three days. He didn't just gather the wood. He didn't just take Isaac on top of the mountain. He didn't just fasten him. He pulled out the knife and literally was in motion, as I read it, in motion. And God said, no, stop it. He was going all the way. He was completing it. And for us, brothers and sisters, we've got to understand God's nature here. And the reason why God, later on, the Bible says that God called Abraham his friend is because God or Abraham obeyed to completion. He was going all the way to the end. And if you look at each one of these things, there's a really cool thing. And if you're, if you're visiting or you don't know the Bible that well, everything points to Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And everything in the New Testament points out from what we do after we come and encounter Jesus. But it's all about Jesus. 
And here, you know, Abraham, Abraham is the God figure. He is the God figure. He has his one and only son. That's why he gets repeated, his only son. And he offers him, he's, he's willing to sacrifice him. And he was, Isaac himself was a precursor to Jesus. He was willing to go the whole way. He trusted his dad, even when his dad tied him up and put him on the altar. He trusted that, hey, God will, the, you know, uh, the, God will provide. He trusted the father. And Jesus went the whole way on the cross. Jesus obeyed immediately. Jesus obeyed with no perceivable gain. There was no gain for him going to the cross, for him being spit on and beaten, for him being nailed to that cross. He obeyed in the dark. He was in the garden saying, if there's another way, may this cup be taken from me. And God did not answer. All the way to the very end where Jesus, as he breathed his last, he said, it is finished. God wants us to obey to completion. And that's how we fear the Lord. And for a lot of us, we're like, hey, you know, great. I was, I was so faithful 15 years ago. I was so, I used to, man, I used to pray so hard. I used to fast. I used to share my faith all the time. And we're way back then. And Jesus is like, no, it's 2019. It's not 1999. You still got work to do. And for some of us, we're like, oh, yeah, I used to go to church as a child. Uh, you know, my mom, I used to love all those songs and all that great stuff. And Jesus is like, yo, you need to complete the, you need to complete the job. You got work to do. Where is your faith today? What are you doing today? <clears throat> We've got to complete the work. Abraham was willing to obey to completion because he feared the Lord. These four disciplines, obeying immediately, obeying uh, at a loss, Obeying in the dark and obeying the completion. These are disciplines that we need to constantly master because God, as we get to one area, we do really well. God will take it even deeper. God will take it even deeper. And then we've kind of got to start all over again. But as we as we grow in these disciplines, we will grow like Jesus in the fear of the Lord and we'll delight in the fear of the Lord and we'll see the benefits of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a discipline. It can be learned. Next week, uh, we're going to talk about how fear of the Lord is not a feeling. The, the fear of the Lord is not a feeling. We've got to work on the disciplines of the fear of the Lord. Obeying immediately. Uh, obeying even at a loss. Obeying in the dark. And obeying to completion. God will bless us. He blessed Abraham. To this day, we still are talking about Abraham. And his faith. We're still talking about his fear of the Lord. Even God said there, he said, now I know you fear God. Because of his willingness to obey to completion. Amen? Amen. God calls us in a great way. Do we have time? We got time for one more song. We're going to have one more song. Uh, and then we're going to dismiss and go get our kids. Have a great Super Bowl.